This is Mrs. O'Neill for Chapter 9, Section 2, Writing Formulas for Ionic Compounds. First, a quick little preview. What do I mean by that? Well, in sections 9.2, 9.3, 9.4, you're going to be writing and naming compounds for three different types of compounds. So in section 2, we're going to be dealing with ionic compounds. Those compounds always start with the metal. Now remember, metals are located to the left of that stair-step line. So anytime you see a metal first, as first part of the compound, you need to think to your head, ooh, I'm going to name it the ionic way. However, in 9.3, we're going to be talking about molecular compounds. Sometimes they're called covalent compounds. Those guys are going to start with non-metal. And those nonmetals are located to the right of that stair step line on the periodic table. Again, we need to kind of take notice as to what type of element we're starting our compound with. And that's why that periodic table chapter was so important. The last type in section 9.4, you're going to learn how to write and name acids. And acids always start with hydrogen. So once you see hydrogen starting a compound, you're going to go ding, ding, ding. Oh yeah, that's an acid. And how do I write or name that acid? So you also want to remember that compounds always, 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 I separate them into two parts. And the first part is always, always going to be positive, And the second part, always, always going to be negative. Now, again, there's going to be some rule breakers, but those are not going to be known in this course. Rule breakers or exceptions to the rules. Those are things you might learn later on in a college course or in the AP course, okay? But for our purposes here in this course, every single compound you see will have a positive first part and a second negative part. So what are you gonna do in this section? You're gonna apply the rules for naming and writing formulas for binary ionic compounds, binary meaning two, and also apply these rules for naming and writing formulas for compounds with polyatomic ions. So this is one of the reasons why I spent so much time getting you to understand how to name a non-metal, because that would be a metal with a non-metal, that's gonna be a binary compound, and how to deal with those polyatomic ions. So hopefully now you are familiar with naming the metal, metal with multiple charges, the non-metal by itself, and the, those polyatomic ions and how to deal with them. So hopefully if all of that kind of makes sense, now we're going to start putting those pieces together. So you should have watched that introductory uh, video from Bozeman Science. And remember, you should have just focused on um, one, uh, one minute, one and a half, mi one, one minute and 12 seconds there uh, to the end. And what he did really was give you some examples of writing ionic formulas. So between what he kind of explained and what I'm going to explain, hopefully now it's going to make sense. So off to your notes packet. At festivals throughout the summer, contestants compete for blue ribbons for the best barbecue. Some cooks say the recipe for their barbecue sauce is the key to winning, and they may hint at a secret ingredient. The recipe is the formula for the sauce, a complete list of ingredients and their proportions. With the recipe, anyone could reproduce a sauce. So a cook is likely to keep a prize-winning recipe as close-guarded secret. Chemistry also uses formulas, but without any secrets. Once you know the rules, you can write the formula for any chemical compound. In this section, you will learn how to write the formulas for ionic compounds. So again, once you know the rules, you're going to kind of put them all together and make that puzzle work. Perhaps one of you gentlemen would mind telling me just what it is outside the window that you find so attractive. Hmm, do you see the positives and the negatives? Very interesting. So these masks are made up of an ionic compound with the common name Jimson. Jimson is also used in wallboard. So for those of you who take art class and make these like past, um, I, I guess they're made out of like plaster, right? I think that's what it's called. 
This name does not tell you, though, anything about the chemical composition of the compound. So remember, a chemical composition or the formula of a compound is going to be very, very helpful, not only to you in this course, but also to those doctors who are prescribing those medicines. So Jimson has the formula CaSO4. So what does this tell us? Well, hopefully in your mind you're thinking, well, it tells us that it has one calcium atom, one sulfur atom, and four oxygen atoms. Or did you think of it this way? It actually has one calcium atom, but it has one polyatomic ion of sulfate. So see that there's like a little bit of a difference, but it's still telling you the same thing. And it's going to tell you uh, more information. Once you get the formula and then we're going to talk structure, it's going to be real interesting and, and knowing that information about a chemical formula altogether. So pause the video. Again, read as you write uh, and then play to hear my words. So as I stated before, binary means two. So if an ionic compound starts with a metal and it only has two elements, it's considered a binary ionic compound. Ionic compounds then with polyatomic ions, that means it's going to have three or more elements. Hopefully that makes sense, right? You're starting with your metal and now you have a polyatomic ion which has many atoms together. Remember, we're going to keep it as a whole unit. That's why I have here, you might need those parentheses uh, because if you have more than one polyatomic ion, you need parentheses to signify that. And I want to remind you that most of those polyatomic ions end in eight or eight, except for those two exceptions that you should either have highlighted or recognized or starred, um, though that cyanide and the hydroxide. And remember that oddball too, ammonium is positively charged. All the others are negative. So you know I like my charts, so I always like to think of a compound as two parts, the first part and the second part. So this is basically stuff we already went over, but the first part's always that positive cation. It's always going to be a metal or it's going to be that ammonium, okay? So if you have ammonium, you might need parentheses because you have more than one of them. So that's that little exception. Uh, second part is always negative. It's going to be a non-metal or, again, those polyatomic ions. And, again, you're going to need those parentheses. So what are you going to do to write a compound? Well, you need the charge of both parts. Once you see the charge of both parts, if the charge number is the same on both parts of that compound, you're just going to rewrite the parts. And if they're different, we're going to crisscross those charge numbers. And again, we might need those parentheses. So that last section that we went over, remember the X, Y? I talked about the first part being X and the second part being Y. Well, I did that for you to get the understanding that there's always a first part of the compound that's always positive, second part that's always negative. And we're going to look at those charge numbers and see what to do with them. So you should have out besides your packet is that periodic chart of ions that's in the end of your packet. Always going to be helpful. So let's look at some examples and then you can do some on your own. So if I'm giving you compound names, the first thing we need to do is figure out the parts of the ion, uh, parts of those ions, right, or the, the parts of those compounds, and then we can put them together. So why don't you pause the video and see if you can find barium and sulfide. All right, so this is binary, by the way. So binary means I should be looking for a metal and just another non-metal. So we should have barium being plus two and sulfur being negative two. And remember that ide, ooh, all of these have ide. That makes sense. Those are those non-metals turning into ide. I don't see any cyanide and I don't see any hydroxide, right? Those are the only two polyatomic ions. So I see ide and I'm signifying that it's binary. So it's only going to be a non-metal. All right, so now we're going to look at these two charge numbers. Since they're the same, we're going to cross them off and just rewrite the parts. All right, let's look at lithium hydroxide. So hopefully you found them on your periodic table there of ions. You found lithium to be plus one. You found oxygen to be negative two. Well, those charge numbers are different, so we're going to crisscross them and get Li2O. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, calcium nitride. Hmm, can you find calcium and nitrogen, or I should say nitride ion on your periodic table? 
you should have found those charges. Again, those are different charge numbers. Those are different charge numbers, so we're going to crisscross them and get Ca3N2. Copper 2 iodide. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't have to look much further uh, than the Roman numerals to tell me what the charge of the copper is, but you might need to look at what iodide is. So you should have found that. And again, those charge numbers are different, so we're going to crisscross them. So just uh, an aside note here, um, just to make sure you're understanding, charge numbers are always high in the sky, but when we crisscross them down to make them part of the compound, those are always going to be low to the ground. Those are always going to be subscripts. So these are superscripts high up, up, up top here, and then when we crisscross them, those are going to be subscripts. All right, pause the video and see if you can do these four. All right, hopefully you pause the video. You came up with the ion parts and the chemical formula. You should have came up with this and this, this and this. So at this point, ladies and gentlemen, if you have questions, you should star them and make sure that you contact me or uh, ask somebody in class. Uh, this one, again, just as an aside note, remember that you're crisscrossing, but because it's a two and a four, we can reduce those numbers. All right, those were um, binary. Now, how about polyatomic ions? So we're gonna do the same thing. Find the parts, and then if we need to, crisscross those charges. So we have magnesium and sulfate. Ooh, eight and eight, I see. Except for this guy, uh-oh. I see eights and eights, so those are going to be polyatomic ions. Charge numbers here are the same, so I'm just going to rewrite those parts. Bismuth three, look at that, bismuth three. So that three tells me the charge of bismuth. I don't even have to look at the periodic table for that, but you might need to look for nitrite. So hopefully you found those. Those charge numbers are different, so we're going to crisscross them. But remember in that previous video, we do not have 23 oxygens. We have three nitrite polyatomic ions. So we need those parentheses. All right, how about number three? You should have found those parts. Those charge numbers are different, so we're going to crisscross them. But because silver is an, uh, an element by itself, you do not need parentheses. And number four, again, I'm giving you the charge of lead because of the Roman numerals. Cyanide is one of those exceptions. That's a polyatomic ion of capital C and capital N. Again, those charge numbers are different. We're going to crisscross them. But remember, in this case, you still need those parentheses because you do not have four nitrogens. You have four cyanide polyatomic ions. Okay, can you do these practice problems? Pause, do the parts, and see if you remember now if you need to crisscross or not, and use parentheses. So you should have paused and got this information, those information, how about that, and the last one. Einstein, you might have been weird to find. I think that's one of the higher element numbers, maybe in the uh, all the way on the bottom there. Uh, but they work the same way, right? Those those inner transition metals are still metals. All right, and there's a couple more here. Can you do these? If you want to, you can put them right in the margins of your packet. So pause, read this over, some interesting information, and can you come up with the formulas for those two ionic compounds? Hopefully you came up with this. And again, I wanted to give you another example of where you're crisscrossing them and reducing them. How about this guy? Pause, read, come up with the formula. Hopefully that makes sense. And how about this guy? And does that make sense? Again, iron uh, three hydroxide is very different than iron two oxide. Ooh, I don't know why I said hydroxide, sorry. Iron three oxide and iron two oxide are two totally different compounds and they're going to be totally two uh, different ways of reacting with other uh, substances. How about this guy? Hopefully you came up with that. And this one. Did you come up with that? I'm hoping. And I have two more. Hopefully you paused and came up with this guy and this guy. Again, the more practice you get, the more understanding and the more used to using uh, parentheses and those kinds of things. 
All right, I will see you in class. And again, if you have questions, that's when you need to ask them. Uh, contact me or somebody else in class.